Uh, let's start on section 3.4, velocity and other rates of change. Let's talk about instantaneous rates of change. Okay, we have to find the instant rate, instantaneous rate of change as being the derivative function, f prime of a, where, where that's equal to the limit is h approaches zero of f of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Now, if you want to change all those a's into x's, it's going to be the same thing. But the idea is that we have some function. And, of course, this limit, this derivative, is the instantaneous rate of change. What other synonyms do we use for this? Rate of change at a point, tangent line, or slope at a point. We have all these synonyms that mean these same things and all have to do with the slope at a particular instance. <laughs> now, that's nothing new. No. What's the new part? Well, when do we use these ideas of instantaneous rates of change? Well, let's say we have some situation that we're modeling. For example, the area, the area of a square is a function of its radius. Something's wrong there. Excuse me. Yeah, I think we'll change this to circle. Yeah. By the way, this is math type. Um, a, a, a cleaner, easier to use version of this is built into Microsoft Word. It's called Microsoft Equation. And they want really? uh, all the way back to like oh. Office XP. I mean, is that what the Sigma? Right? Yeah. No, no, no. Sigma in Excel is for the to get up the sum of a bunch of numbers. This is if you go into Word and you say insert object. One of the objects you can choose is a Microsoft Equation, and yeah, you can do this. You can do all that special math type stuff. How would we need to do that? What? Why would you not want to do that? Oh, there's a better question. It's just that I don't need to for anything. Sure you do. Lab reports? Reports for calculus? Continuing on. So if the area of a circle is a function of its radius, meaning you give me a radius, I give back to you the area of the circle. You say one, oh, I say the area is pi. You say two, oh, I say four pi. You say five, I say 25 pi. You give me a radius, I give you back an area of a circle. We could say then, what is the rate of change in A with respect to R? What is the rate of change in A when R is equal to 4? These are the questions that we can ask now about instantaneous rate of change. Well, the rate of change would use the notation dA dr. dA, thinking about the change, think of that letter D as being like the letter de being the idea of delta. The change in area with respect to the change in radius, dA dr. Yeah, Ian. Isn't it pi r squared, not two pi r? No. Area, area is pi r squared. This is the derivative of area with respect to r. So r is a variable. Oh, it's okay. changing. What is the derivative of pi r squared? Well, what's that? Is it? Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> Actually, we're going to see we're going to see uh, later on. There's this relationship between areas and and arc lengths, and we're also going to find there's going to be a relationship between um, volumes and surface areas uh, by using the by using calculus. So, but indeed, the rate of change in area. Okay. Wait, what about this pi thing? Pi is a constant. So we use the constant multiplier rule. And then we're just going to take the derivative of r squared with respect to r. What rule are we going to use for that? Power rule. 
So this 2 is from that exponent. So the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change in the area with respect to r is 2 pi r. What is that rate of change when r is 4? It's going to be 8 pi. What do we do? We take our rate of change derivative and say, well, this is when r is 4. Make, replace every occurrence of r with the number 4 and 8 pi. Are we ready for the next slide? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, one more thing here. This notation, dA, dr, change in area with respect to change in r. Okay. Whatever variable is listed in the bottom of that denominator, that's the with respect to variable. All right. Let's talk about another place where derivatives come into play to talk about instantaneous rate of change. Let's say an object is moving along some coordinate line. Maybe I'm the object. Maybe the coordinate line is running along the, the floor here. Okay? And so that I'm in some position S at some time T. So maybe I start over here, and now it's time zero. And then I walk over here, and there's time 1, time 2, time 3, time 4, time 5, time 6, time 7, time 8, time 9, time 10, time 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm accumulating all these different positions as I move. Yes, Phil? Is that how GPSs work? GPS is... Well, there's a couple, there's, lot, there's lots of great mathematics working in, in GPSs. But when a GPS tells you how fast you're moving, what it's doing is actually closer to an uh, uh, a average rate of, of, of change. It takes some delta, usually one second, and says, where was I? Where am I now? What, how far have I moved? Divided by that one second. And then, of course, then they convert that to miles per hour. So they're doing, they're doing average, average rates of change, not instantaneous rates of changes on the GPS. All right? But if I had this function that described what position I was at at some time t, we have some quantities that we can get from that equation. First of all, we might call uh, one idea a displacement. The displacement is just like what we talked with Phillips just a second ago. Where is I? Where was I? Where am I now? Where am I going to be? Some delta t time later. The difference between those two values is how much I've moved during that delta t. Amelia, you have a question? No. You had your hand kind of up. No. Oh. Amelia. Emily. My daughter's name is Amelia. I don't know why I came out of it. All right? The average velocity, again, which is what typically the GPS is doing, is the displacement divided by that slice of time. Now, if you make the slices of time really, really small, you come close to getting what instantaneous velocity is. But, in general, where, are, where was I at time t? Where am I at time t plus delta t? That difference is how much I moved. How much time has passed between those two locations is my delta t. And then my average velocity ends up being the, the quotient. That looks a lot like uh, zero. Yeah. Well, what happens when delta t approaches zero? You, you end up getting instantaneous speed as compared to average speed. Average velocity, sorry. I got to make sure I use the right words here. Average velocity. And of course, there you go, Paul. There's what you wanted. The instantaneous speed 
is what happens when delta t goes to zero. Yeah, how's that? Yeah, that was it. There you go. That's it. That's all you needed? Yeah. Really? I was being a jerk. <laughs> okay. So again, instantaneous is where the limit of delta t approaches zero. Now, can you make every occurrence of delta t turn into an h? Yes. And it ends up just being the derivative function. Yeah. And how are we going to describe that velocity? How about ds dt? The change in S, and S is position, change in position with respect to T. Sometimes I'll say change of position with respect to time. And then that, of course, is equal to our velocity, our velocity function. Now, uh, in physics or some other science class, you know the difference between velocity and Speed, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Josh, tell me the difference. Um, velocity is displacement over time, and um, speed is distance over time. Paul? Speed is a scalar quantity, and velocity <laughs> is a vector quantity. Ve vector quantity. Okay. Meaning that velocity <coughs> can be positive or negative based on which direction you're heading. Well, speed. Yep is the absolute value of velocity. It's only the scalar value. It doesn't have a direction associated with it. OK, that's, that's, it's great. OK, and there it is. The speed is the absolute value of the velocity equation. It's the absolute value of ds dt. ds meaning change in location, dt change in time, change position with respect to time. Are we ready to go on to the next slide? No. Acceleration. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Or it's the second derivative. Go ahead. It's the second derivative of position with respect to time d squared s dt squared. Second derivative of position with respect to time. Ready for a problem? You ready for a problem? Yeah. yeah. I think we're ready for a problem. Yeah. Okay. 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 That the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Yes. When I was growing up, we learned it as 32 feet per second squared. You may have also learned that if you drop an object and let it fall, its position can be described as, in the metric system, 4.9 times t squared meters. 
That's how far the object falls. At its position at time t. This, of course, assumes no air resistance. No change in gravity. And for everything that we're likely to do, we can say that gravity remains pretty constant. I mean, even if we go up to the top of the tallest building in our area. Uh, what's that? <laughs> well, I live in Detroit, so we have. Oh, the Renaissance. Yeah, the Renaissance Center. I think it's 78. Sorry, is that right? Three. 73? Okay. What if it lands on its tail? You know what, Phil? I have I have a sneaking suspicion that that whole drop a penny off the Empire State Building thing is a fallacy. And did it kill somebody? No. Because no. I, I think the problem is that because of the nature of the penny, the terminal the terminal velocity is much less slow. If, if, if the air, if the earth was a vacuum. If, if the earth was a vacuum, the person it hit would be dead. <laughs> All right, so let's do a problem now. Let's say I have a situation where some projectile is shot upward, and the height of that projectile is described as negative 5.9 t squared plus 120 t, meaning for every time you give me a value t, I can tell you how high that projectile is. At time equals zero, the projectile is at zero, at time equal one, I could plug the values in for t, and I can get a new position. And so I have a position equation. And now I can ask questions of that position equation. Things like, what is its velocity after five seconds? Meaning, what is its instantaneous velocity? How would we handle that problem? We're going to find the derivative of the position. Now, here's where I, where I think you can take the derivatives. I don't have a question of that. The question is, can you step up your game and make sure you can do this using all the right notation? I would like to know about velocity. Velocity is found by taking the derivative with respect to t of the position equation. And now you can impress me with your derivative taking skills. Yes, absolutely. Negative 9.8 t plus 120. So that's our general velocity equation. What's the velocity at time 5? You note the notation there. If I had to put a little bit more notation on that first one, I might put a parenthesis t there. Velocity is a function of time. So what is the velocity at time 5? Negative 9.8 times 5 plus 120 equals what? 71. 75. 71. 71. Meters per second. We gotta watch. We gotta watch our units here. Units are important. AP will be looking at units as well. Meters, meters per second. Why? Because we were told our original equation was in meters and seconds. No, acceleration is in meters per second. We're taking. We're asking about velocity. Second question. Second question, how high does this projectile go? 
645 C says Tylo Doris. It's, it's, it's so you use so Tylo, you use this method, the eh, yep. <laughs> method of finding the answer. <laughs> now, how can we use calculus to find the answer to this question? Charlie, do you have an opinion? Yeah, um, where your derivative function equals zero, that will be a um, horizontal tangent, which, which, I mean, you can tell that it's a parabola, so you can tell that the horizontal tangent, the only horizontal tangent will be at the arc. Um, okay, the so this idea that when a projectile goes up, when it's at its highest, its velocity, let's say these are, as it's going up, all these are positive velocities. At some point, the velocity turns into zero and then starts coming back down. It has negative velocity. But the, the moment it reaches its apex is a time when the velo instantaneous velocity is zero. Lucy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's do that. Let's set our velocity. equal to zero. Now what? Subtract 120, I get negative 9.8t is equal to negative 120. Divide by negative, oh, can't write. Divide by negative 9.8, negative 9.8, and we get 12.2. Four, five, four, four, eight, nine. Okay. Now the reason why I want to bring this up, Phil, is not that because you, your answer is wrong. Is that the AP, um, the the College Board and their graders have an expectation that if you present any number in decimal form your final answer will be rounded to three decimal places. So I wanted to make sure that when we got this, that we each showed at least three decimal places. So the college board answer is 12.245, uh, just like you said. And then, of course, don't forget your unit. All right? Does that answer the question? It does answer the question. It's the cross times the cross times the cross times the cross. Then, I'm sorry, then we have another problem there. Ready? I'm going to erase this. We are not yet to the final answer. Mm. We, don't, we don't round. It turns into position. We don't round until final answer. So, 12.2449. No. 8.4486. Okay. That 9 is going to become an 8. Nine, seven, nine, six. Okay. And then we say S of twelve point two four four nine eight nine seven nine six is equal to because S is our position, so we'll plug the time into our position equation. And we get the time at which it reached its, its, max, its maximum height. But the question is, 
what is its position when it reached its maximum height? Yep, into our position equation. Here, and I'm going to make a comment here. We need to be really particular about the language we use. There's lots of equations here, so let's be particular. Our position equation, our position function. How do we find this? Because we set the velocity function equal to zero. We're going to ban the word it in this room. Yeah, it's been banned. Because it's not, it's vague. Hey, whoa. The word it is vague. It is vague. That is an equivalent statement. Yeah, it turns into a, a bad version of like the knights who say me. I am no longer the knight who says me. Okay. When does it hit the ground? So, oh, see it? Did you hear it? I heard it. Okay. Phil, restate, please. Set the position equation equal to zero to find out when, when the projectile hits the ground? Sure. So if we set S of T equal to zero, We can take a T out. And that's the origin. Okay. This one is indeed, I won't call it the origin. This is the, init the initial location. When this portion is equal to zero, is the other time it's back at ground level. Now, I already heard someone say something very sly, and that is, we found when the uh, projectile reached its highest point, and <laughs> what happens as much time as it took to go up, it takes the same amount of time to go down. Okay. Now, of course, they're going to be, they'll be tricky. They'll be tricky on the way they word these problems on you. By the way, this way works. I'm not going to calculate it. But on one of the AP exams, they had a person diving into water, and they can't use that trick. They're jumping off of a 10 meter. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, it's the idea that you double the amount of time to, you know, from, from ground to apex and you double it to get the ground again. That doesn't work in all situations when you're firing off a cliff or you're firing to the top of a mountain or something like that. Well, I got the opposite. So, good luck. So, I'll see my best back in here. Um, are you going to be back in time? Hopefully not. Yeah, you take it with you then. All right. Yeah, Tyler. Maybe you do it so you can get Well, I think, I think Phil's plan, if we set this equal to zero, uh, it's my, it's my T, uh, negative 4.9 T is equal to 120, negative 120, divide by negative 4.9, divide by negative 4.9, can't read my writing, T is equal to, sorry? 48.4 which means when we round <laughs> Boy, 
It's almost like I'm writing with the hand that's hurt. Or with the marker in my teeth. Okay. So, um, how are we doing on time? Six minutes. Six minutes? You can do it. All right. Okay, when a small change in X produces a large change in the function, we say the function is relatively sensitive to changes in X. Okay. The analogy of this is the, uh, the infamous butterfly effect. Have you heard of the butterfly effect? Yeah. Yeah. Action picture? Well, no, not the movie that was based on that idea. But essentially, this idea, the idea that the flapping of a butterfly's wings on the other side of the globe eventually will affect global weather. Weather is a, weather is a thing that is sensitive to initial conditions, and very small changes in initial conditions have very big effects. Yes? Butterfly change is like you change something in the past and you saw in the past and it changes the future. It's the movie, oh my god. Oh, it's Ashton Kutcher was great. Why don't we get a thousand butterflies all in the wings Because it's not that we know how it changes, oh, we just know that it will. Weather is a system that's extremely sensitive to initial conditions. So small changes pile up. This is why it's really, really difficult to forecast the weather more than five days in advance. Because the model, the model, the weather modeling, if you change the seventh or eighth decimal place, all of a sudden, over the course of ten days, the models totally diverge from the from the weather predicted. Small changes, okay. The derivative of f prime of x is the way that we can measure these small sensitive changes. So the bigger the derivative, the larger the small change in x, the more sensitive. Sorry, the larger the absolute value of that. Of that. I'm trying to ponder in what world that was an appropriate thing to do. Coming up short. What was that? Like a dance? A singing? That was Aretha Franklin. Okay. Okay. So, derivatives also have is a tool, is a tool in economics. If we think, well, first of all, in economics, e economics is often interested in these things called um, marginal things. What happens with just when you do just a little bit of change? Well. If some things are sensitive, for example, you probably are not, okay, if the price of gas goes up a penny, does it cause a lot of change? Yeah. Yeah. To whom? The business owners, the, the people running the gas stations? And the oil. Okay, so, so, so a marginal change, a change of one penny, not... It goes from one penny to two penny, but change from of one penny has an effect on the economy. Okay. Now, one other idea is on these ideas of the margins is marginal cost of production. How much more does it cost to produce that extra item, that one more unit? Now, typically, what happens is on the marginal cost of productions is that. The cost of production, the marginal cost of production reduces over time as the number of units that you're building goes up. So if I've already built the factory, and I've already hired the workers, and I've already got the line rolling, the marginal cost to get that first truck off the line, very expensive. But after the first truck rolls off, to get the second truck off the line, not so expensive, because all that equipment's already been bought and all those materials have already been purchased. Third, fourth, each 
additional unit, the marginal cost goes down. And so what we say is that that marginal cost of production, the cost to produce the additional item, is a rate of change in the cost per item. Well, guess what that is? That's a derivative. All right. Your assignment. This, is, this requires some extra. Every other odd. Yeah. Katie, what happened here?